Elections provide an important opportunity to advance democracy. But a country cannot be truly democratic until its citizens have the opportunity to choose their representatives through elections that are free, fair and credible. In 111 days from now, Nigerians will once again be opportune to decide who governs them as the country prepares for another election year. Now, the keenly anticipated 2019 general election will commence with the presidential poll on February the 16th, and it will mark the first general vote since the country's forced transition of power to an opposition party. Good afternoon and welcome to another exciting episode of Standpoint. I am Nifemi Ogunthoye. On the first half of the show today, we'll be extraying the viability of the Buhari or Shimbaju ticket, and later we'll beam a searchlight on the crisis rock in the Imo State chapter of the All Progressives Congress. I have in the studio strategic members of the Buhari Oshimbaju campaign organization, Barista Wali Fakonda and Yinka Ogundimo. Welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. All right, so recently, INEC um, declared that 79 political parties have already submitted names of their presidential candidate for the 2019 presidential election. That figure is 65 higher than what we had in 2015, where only 14 candidates contested the presidential election. Some say this, in and of itself, is more or less a revolt against the Mohamed Buhari administration. Let me begin with you, Barrister Wale. How do you react to that? Well, I do not see it as a revolt against the current administration. I think more and more people are beginning to understand that uh, they need to exercise their constitutional right. Mm. The constitution is clear on it. You have the right to join uh, or form political associations. You have the right to form political parties. And there is no ceiling on the number of candidates that will run for the presidential election in Nigeria. Mm. So if you understand that as the basis for the exercise of your political rights, then you won't say it's a revolt. It's just exercise of constitutional rights. So you're not uh, baffled with the numbers at all? Not at all, not at all. All right, so in 2014, the Buhari campaign promise hinged on the tripod of uh, restoring security, especially in the northern parts of the country, redigging the economy, as well as um, fighting corruption. Some have said the best they can reach this administration is trying to bring Nigeria or take Nigeria back to what it was before 2015. And I'm talking about the economy precisely. A bag of rice that was 7,000 naira is now above, above 17,000 naira. Uh, one US dollar was trading for 197 naira. It's now 360 naira. A liter of fuel was 87 naira. It's now 145. Not to talk about the skyrocketing cost of transportation and all this. Do you agree that the well, nation's economy was faring better before the advent of this administration? It depends on which angle you're taking it from. I just showed you some angles. Yes, the figures are right. You've talked about increasing the price of oil. Mm. That's not debatable. It's there. You've talked about um, other increases. Talking about the dollar, the rate of a dollar to a naira. That's right. Fair enough. What I would say to that is, in this context, you've found stability in this prices. We had, we had it um, rocky at the beginning of the administration. Mm. That was trying to get in, it went into recession. The prices of oil went down before it regained. There was a rebound. And after that, everything stabilized. So with the stability now, you're finding the dollar remaining at 360 officially, which you could get at the bank. Mm. And of course, the price of oil has remained stable. You found maybe just once now, since the advent of this administration, would you say you would have found queues at the filling stations and all of that. But specifically, we had to get there. The price of oil that went down contributed to the issue where we have the rise in the price of oil. Mm. Don't forget that. The refineries have not been working until lately, where they're now beginning to put refineries together. Private refineries are beginning to come up, could see this administration. So bringing them in, we've not, we've, I mean, we've not been refining. So of course, with the prices then not being steady, 
of course, what do you expect? So it's not to say that these are, the, these are things that we could not just do without. If it had been any other administration, it would have been the same. I want I'm us to concerned. explore this vis-a-vis uh, -vis the burden on the average Nigerian citizen. All of these increases are happening at a time where the minimum wage still remains at 18,000 naira. Barrister. Okay, I think we need to be a little bit elaborate on some of these economic issues that you talked about. And then how do we ascertain whether this government has done the best in the circumstance? It's to try to also juxtapose this with what previously obtained in view of the resources that is available to the previous government, okay? Now, you know, or we all know, that as a result of the crash, as a result of the, the crash and the price of crude oil, which is the, which was the sole product that Nigeria trades in, mm -hmm. as a result of that, there was so much burden on the Naira to the point that the Naira was losing value. Okay, so what should have happened in that instance is that if you have sufficient savings, you will be able to cushion the effect of all of these things. At some point, we were selling crude oil at about $148 uh, dollar per, per barrel, okay, when we were also exporting 2.2 million barrels per day, and there was no unrest in the Niger Delta at that point in time. So if you look at all of those things, you will be able to um, to juxtapose it with what is on ground now, to be able to ascertain if this government have done what it ought to do in the circumstance. Now, this government have sold crude oil for as low as $27. And as at that time that we're talking about, the cost of production for crude oil was about $25 per barrel. So if you look at it, you look at the revenue that is coming to the, to the government, and then you now look at that as the basis for determining whether this government has done what it ought to do, mm. you know? So the revenue was low as a result of the crash in, in price of uh, crude oil, and then it has concomitant effect on the value of the Naira. The Naira was losing value. But even as at that, if you go um, a little bit historical, in 2007, when Jonathan government came in, or when Yaradua Jonathan government uh, came into power, they met the dollar at $130, 130 Naira per dollar, and they left it at 235 Naira per dollar. That represents about 82% loss in the value of the Naira. Okay, when Buhari's government came in, we met at 235 Naira to a dollar, and it is, it is at 360 now at a stabilized rate. That's about 50, 53% loss in the value. But then the issue again is this, the previous government had so much funny earnings from oil that could have cushioned the effects on the Naira, but they refused to do that. You're saying in fact, in fact, mm. in fact, the former Minister of Finance and the Coordinating Minister of the Economy actually said that this government or the previous government lacked the will and the political will to save. Mm. So they've simply refused to save to be able to cushion this effect, which is not the effect, which is not the, 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 the fault of this government. Mm. And so we talked about rice, that the price of rice is also, uh, is also, uh, um, is also has not really changed. You then compare that with if we have not been locally producing rice now, and with the number, with the crash in the value of the Naira, the price of rice would have gone to about 30,000 to 40,000 uh, 40, Naira per bag. But now we are locally producing it. There is 90% reduction of rice importation in Nigeria now. We are locally producing it. It's creating a lot of value at the chain of transaction. We bag it here, we transport it, we grow the rice here, we do all of those things, it's creating job, it's having high level concomitant effect on the economy. So that's the simple argument for all of these things. Okay, so uh, it appears like you're giving excuses and reasons why uh, we are where we are currently as regards the economy. But let's move, move further a bit. Vice President Yemi Oshimbajo mm -hmm. is uh, the head of the economic team for this administration. And a lot of, um, there's been a lot of stories about how much work the Economic and Recovery Growth Plan, uh, an initiative of the economic team, you know, how much work they have put in place. As a matter of fact, uh, they've reported um, improvement in the ease of doing business and that how that helped us out of the recession. But in another breath, an international organization, Brookings Institution, says that Nigeria, earlier in the year, took over from India 
as the headquarters of poverty in the world. We're looking at a figure, alarming figure of over 80 million Nigerians living in poverty. I'm coming to you now, uh, Yinka. How do we reconcile both reports? And which of them, in your opinion, do you think best reflects the current reality of the Nigerian people? Well, I'm, I'm not aware of that figure. If we're talking about a population of about 180 million, I didn't get to see that report, and I would want to take that um, report. Which of the reports are you referring to now? I'm not referring to any report. I'm, I'm referring just, to the Broken Institution I'm report. I'm not, I'm not aware of that. That says that I, Nigeria has taken over from India as the country that has the highest number of poor people in the world. As I'm saying, I've not read that report. I didn't see that report. But basically, all I'm interested in now is, I mean, we've read about Forbes that rated Nigeria as the fastest growing African economy. As the best economy. As the best economy in Africa. We saw that and listed about two, three specific areas in which Nigeria has been able to, I mean, leap. leap. So, uh, but when you want to look at the economy, the ease of doing business recently won I mean, was also rated high in some areas. We find a situation where, especially this administration, is really, really looking down, really looking down to, I mean, microcredit business, micro businesses, small enterprises, and of course, medium skilled businesses. Mm -hmm. They're doing everything possible because it has been understood that no economy will grow. This is the first time in the history of Nigeria, as far mm -hmm. as I'm concerned, that is looking at the small, medium skilled businesses, micro, small and medium skilled businesses to see how it can buffer up what they're doing. You find out that even small skilled businesses, you find in situations where they're being granted interest free loans to would, help Would you businesses. say that these small and medium skilled businesses are faring better under this administration given uh, several other factors? Uh, there's the issue of power, Mm. There is some good roads. Mm. There is what many people call other indices uh, that are required for small businesses to grow. There's the issue of insecurity. You see, I, what, what I can tell you that it has been kick-started. The journey might be a long one. Nobody starts working in a day. But something has, a foundation is being laid. Mm. You're looking at the short-term effects and you're also looking at the long-term effects. Mm. Granting loans, granting resources, making open the ease of doing business, all the issues that are meant to grant short-term effects to, to jumpstart these businesses. Now the long-term effects which you're talking about, of course, in the in, in, in area of power, mm. there's so much being done. When this administration came into power, it started with about 3,000 megawatts of power. But now it's, it's left to about 5,000, ranging between 5,000 and 7,000 megawatts of power being generated. Mm and transmitted. The problem we have is in the area of distribution. And we've read in the past, we've seen the minister came on the other day to talk about what is happening in the distrib dis uh, distribution sector. Mm. That is where we have the major problems. It was privatized. We know those who bought these companies. We know what is happening. All these are in the, in the media space. So, but as well as it is, as we come difficult to tackle. The mm. government is doing everything possible. It just recently cleared some equipment abandoned by this, uh, the companies at the port to ease their ways of doing, of, car of making, sure, making sure that you and I get power into our homes. I'd love us to uh, uh, quickly touch on all the issues very quickly because okay. of our time. Uh, well, just uh, beginning with the economy, let's quickly mm. talk about um, the fight against corruption, which also became very loud. As a matter of fact, some would say that was, was, that was exactly what made President Mohamed Buhari popular in 2014. You know, Nigerians perceive him as an honest man who was going to bring sanity into the system. But how do you think that the perception of um, fighting the opposition, you know, using anti-graft efforts to wage war against the opposition, how do you think that that is being resolved at such a critical time like this? Okay, um, just to get a quick permission for me, before I talk on the issue of fight against corruption, let me also talk about that uh, rating that you say is Nigeria is the uh, uh, capital, poverty capital of the world. You okay. see, um, you, don't, you don't start dying in a day, okay? It's a gradual thing. But you so, are aware about that. Yeah, no, no, I'm aware, I'm aware of the report. Mm. I'm aware of the report. 
But the truth of the matter is this. This was the poverty of this foundation had been laid and we keep, you know, cementing and reinforcing this foundation. Some will say that exactly why the APC was voted for in 2015. And yes, that's exactly. Why measures are being and that's why place. measures are being taken in place to ensure that uh, we correct this. Uh, you don't, uh, mm, excuse me, mm. excuse me. You see, you do not expect an economy that witnessed that level of mindless looting over the years not to come up, not to have this kind of symptoms. You the don't expect... The anatema, Barrister, is that no. the figures increased aftermath the administration that you are alleging now. It will that only was very increase. Corrupt. It will only increase. As a matter of fact, if that administration had not left, mm -hmm. it will also continue increasing for the next four to eight years. But this government had come in now to put a stop to all of these things. Okay. If you are... I mean, as a journalist, you know... Just last week, there was a revelation that came out that crude oil amounting to about $12.7 billion was stolen. You don't expect that kind of economy not to have this kind of symptoms. You don't expect yeah. economy whereby they had a strategic alliance contract, the money was stolen, uh, monies were hermarked for the fight of insurgency. You know, so you expect all this kind of, all this kind of ratings. So that is it. But then, I mean, it's also an, it's an offshoot of what we have been going through in the past. Mm. And I can tell you very emphatically that the figures will change in 2018, 2019 because so of the financial crisis. You that this mentioned government. just now about the, the issue of stolen crude oil. And yeah. I, I want us to quickly yes, you know, talk about corruption. Mm. You yes. know, the big challenge here is the fact that the masses don't seem to feel the positive effect of government's fight against corruption. Because if you're saying that, the reason why we're where we are right now is corruption. Mm -hmm. And then we have an administration that is fighting corruption. Then the economy should have you know, gotten better see, than the, this. The only, way, the only way I think the masses can you know, feel the effect of this anti-corruption, or one of the ways, let me not say the only way, is in terms of deterrence. You know, mm -hmm. As a lawyer, uh, one of the things they will teach you at the early stage of your criminal law class is that the purpose of criminal law, one of it is to act as deterrence. Mm. Nobody, no right-thinking human being, will see what some of these guys that have stolen money, what they are going through in terms of harassed, in terms of seizing, that will also say uh, stealing government resources is attractive any longer. So I think I want to disagree with you that the masses are not feeling the impact. They are actually feeling the impact. It is actually working and uh, having an effect on the moral fiber of the society because people are now beginning to see, unlike what used to be the order of the day, people are now beginning to see that, wow, it is not a very good thing to do all of these things, and these are the likely repercussion that is going to be attendant to stealing government resources. Okay, that is on the one hand. Then on the other hand, when people come up with allegation of uh, um, 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 partisan consideration in the anti-corruption fight, I think it is only a natural reaction for anybody that was arrested just to say something. And that's why they say all of these things. The truth of the matter is this. There are two sides to all of these things. One, if you have not stolen, nobody will come and meet you. I mean, I'm a Yoruba man. They say that uh, mm -hmm. if you have not eaten, uh, uh, it's best spoken in Yoruba, but the point is this. So you must have taken government money before they, they, they come to you. That is the first point. Then the second point of it being partisan, I strongly disagree. And I keep telling people, let us speak to the record. There are members of the APC that whose, whose criminal uh, uh, trials are still going on. I've mentioned some, I mean, the time passed. We have Oji Uzo Kalu, who is a member of the APC. The last time, his lawyer has brought an, uh, an application for a no-case submission. The judge said, no, you have to open your case. Mm. In fact, the man that just defected from Kano, Malam Shekarao, the judge in the case retired, and they have to bring in another judge so that the matter will start de novo. It was rearranged. So there are quite a number of these APC uh, 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 people within the ruling party that are also facing these corruption charges. So right. I don't know what, mm. what they are talking about. EFCC no doubt has some impressive record of conviction. However, the challenge is with the high profile cases uh, that seem to spend eternity in our courts. What is yeah. responsible you for wouldn't that? Blame, you wouldn't blame um, the president for that. It's a judicial system. While he's here, so he knows what I'm talking about. So you're saying and that... Uh, the judiciary operates parallel to 
who ever runs the government. One would have thought that one of the reasons why we elected a president is to bring changes in all of the fabrics, all of the aspects of the society, You're the right. judiciary involved. You're right. But I am aware to an extent, I'm a lawyer, so I try to, I'm not a lawyer, I try to avoid such situations when you're talking about these legal terms because it could be as worrisome for anyone as well that even as much as possible as there are these people who have been, who have been brought to book, but then the judicial system is very slow in getting things done. I'm also aware of the fact that there is an anti-corruption bill that was sent to the Senate, mm -hmm. but it has not been, nothing has been done on it. So it questions, do you understand where the, I mean, an arm of government is trying to work on certain things mm -hmm. and has been frustrated? Mm -hmm. And maybe that's some of the reasons why we found what happened, or what is even happening now in both houses. Well, I think as a follow-up, mm -hmm. a very quick follow-up to that, you see, when you talk about law, and especially criminal law, and any other branch of law, you see they are basically divided into two. You have the substantive law and you have the procedural law. So the substantive law touches on the subject matter, and the procedural law is the process for enforcing the claim mm -hmm. or for the criminal litigation. So I think there is need for a reform in our law, to be very honest. You know, but this uh, um, essentially cannot be placed at the doorstep of the president. A lot of people are actually involved in all of these things. I am coming, just part, part, okay. of the, part of the procedural laws, I mean, part of the issues in procedural law, as a, in fact, the vice president, as the attorney general of <laughs> Lagos State, was actually champion the uh, um, administration of uh, criminal justice reform in Lagos State. Mm -hmm. And that was what led to the administration of criminal justice law of Lagos State, which the administration of criminal justice acts you know, is a, more or less a reproduction of that. It was Professor Yemiro Shibaju. In fact, and if you look at the provisions of those law, they contain provisions such as day-to-day, -day, you know, uh, a trial of criminal matters. So these are the reforms, but we are not there yet because as we have uh, um, corrupt politicians, we also have corrupt lawyers <laughs> that we also want to, you know, latch on the loopholes and the lacuna in the law just to waste, you know, some of these, uh, to, to waste time. I'm also concerned about how the international community uh, thinks that we're faring when it comes to fighting corruption. That is fantastic. And global you... anti-corruption watchdog, Transparency International, has again ranked Nigeria low in its 2017 Corruption Perception Index. As a matter of fact, the latest ranking puts Nigeria at 148th position out of 180 countries of the world. As of 2015, we had them 26 out of 100. In 2017, I mean, in 2015, it was 26 of 100. In 2017, it was 28 out of 100. How well would you say that we have done? I honestly do not know what data is available for the analysis of Transparency International. And you will also agree with me that there have been so much argument and suspicion about the way Transparency International goes, about rating Nigeria, both in corruption, human rights, and all of those things. And there'll be a lot of face-off mm. by the Nigerian government with the Transparency International. Okay. But what I can point to you is that we all know that, I'm not saying America is the Alpha and Omega, but we know that when America sneezes, the world catches cold. When the president visited the White House, I mean, the president of the United States of America, uh, Donald Trump, made a very interesting and, you know, very instructive statement about the anti-corruption fight in Nigeria. And he actually commended the president of Nigeria. So, I mean, if that is coming from the White House, then we should know about what the world is seeing or how the world is perceiving Nigeria. And also the former, the former ambassador to the United States of America granted an interview with Channels, uh, Channels TV very recently and you know, commending the president mm -hmm. and then saying that the problem with Nigeria is that the corruption is more or less institutionalized and structured in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. So I think the government, I mean, to be very honest, uh, I think the government has achieved if I've achieved more than enough in, in the fight against corruption. I mean, monies are being restored, houses are being busted to recover raw dollars and all of those things, you know, so, and we are getting convictions, despite the fact that we still have some problems with the procedural laws. People are getting scared. There are some conversations you cannot have again in Nigeria. 
before now, once you want to go and get a contract from a government agency, <laughs> all you need to say is that the president knows about this. Please let me keep this 20% or 30% mm -hmm. for the president. But mm -hmm. you cannot say that about the President Muhammad Bari and Professor Yemi Oshibaju. They are simply above boards. You cannot have that conversation with anybody. If you have that conversation there and then, you'll be arrested. It's because right. you know that and it's once, not And true. once everyone sees that the people at the top are not in the bandwagon, of course, you go to, go to some government offices in Abuja and you see there's a level of decorum now. Unlike well, it, when it was brazenly done, everybody would do. Even with the Bureau for Public Procurement, everything now is being done transparently. It's all right. Government agencies. Even though some would say that what we're doing is fighting corrupt people and not fighting corruption, as it were. But I'm going to give you some minutes to talk about um, um, the candidacy of um, Buhari or Shimbajo, especially when some people are already talking about a two-house trade, the chances of Buhari against someone like Atiku, who was from the APC. He's been contesting also since 1993. He's from the Northeast and also is septuagenarian like your principal. What are the chances of uh, uh, um, the incumbent in the 2019 general election? Let me begin with you. <laughs> well, I'm sure Nigerians are wiser now and Nigerians know what they want. Comparing the candidacy of President Muhammad Buhari to that of an article. Of course, you do, nobody wants to go years back. This is somebody who has been condemned locally by his principal, condemned internationally. And here we are, we're trying to reset our minds. We're trying to see things moving forward. We want to go backwards. Mm. He had an economic team. He kept on, he keeps on talking about his economic team. He, the, well, what, what, how do you want to read the economic team? that he had it, then he, keep, he kept on talking about. There is somebody that you cannot be talking about, his businesses, is employed 50,000. Where do we rate all of that? Where do you want to put all of that? You're talking about an administration that is particular, passionate about Nigerians. And this is why they're coming up with some of these policies we're talking about. It, it, an administration that is deeply seated, deeply passionate about the plight of Nigerians. You want to compare that with somebody, people who, for heaven's sake, for all they have done, is just basically right. about them. Barrister Wale, why do you think Nigerians should uh, vote for President Buhari again in 2019? You know, it, it, it's, it's just like in, in law school, they, they told us a Latin magazine that receives a loquitor. Mm. The facts speak for itself. Okay. I really do not think, I mean, that we need to actually expend energy on this thing. The facts speak for itself. There was a previous government that sold crude oil at an average of $130 to $140. How much was the foreign reserve when they were living power? $29 billion. Mm. This government came in, sells crude, sold crude oil, started with $27 per barrel when the production cost was $25. And I've been able to grow that reserve to about $48 billion. Do, we, do you honestly think we should have that conversation that we should we vote for? Do you honestly think? I mean, we, it, the fact is this government have done more. Look at the infrastructure that they've done in the, to boost the economy. I don't know when last you applied the Lagos Ibadan Expressway. But if you've done that recently, you will see what is going there, going on there. Look at the first part. About of nine the... people still died on that road just a couple of days ago. Just, just for your information. It's quite unfortunate. Mm -hmm. But the point I'm making is that I'm talking about the level of infrastructural investment in that axis. Okay. Look at the rail, Lagos Cano Rail, the first leg of the Lagos Cano Rail, Lagos Ibado uh, Rail, that is estimated to be completed in, in December By 2018. December. These are things that have been there. Look at the second Niger Bridge. Look at infrastructure across board, across the length and breadth of the country. And then we should still be having this conversation for a government that will sign contracts with foreign counterparts to provide loan to, for, for, for the provision of infrastructure. They will simply refuse to provide their counterpart funding. They will budget for it and steal it. And nobody has been asking them questions. I'm hoping that uh, majority of the Nigerian electorate share your opinion when they get to the poll in 2019. I've been speaking with strategic members of the Buhari Oshimbaju campaign organization, Barista Wali Fakonda and Yinka Hogundimo. Thank you very much for finding time to join us. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much, much. Nifemi.
Let's go on the short break now. The discussion continues when we return.